Okay, our next speaker is uh, Michael Gola, also from College Station, Texas. Uh, Mr. Michael Gola is a senior lecturer of 22 years at the College of Engineering Department of, uh, of Engineering Technology and Industrial Distribution, College Station. Uh, he's a full-time instructor that specializes in mechanical and fluid power systems and has built, built two labs, the Bosch Rexroth RC Womack Fluid Lab and the DXP Pump Lab, which, uses, uh, which he uses to he teach undergraduate, junior, and senior level industrial distribution students. He also manages and instructs a continuing education program for the pump and pump systems industry. Michael has both an engineering undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering technology and a master's of business administration. He grew up on a farm uh, near San Antonio, Texas, um, in the community of, of St. Hedwig. Am I saying that correctly? That's right. Okay, he's still actively supporting the agricultural industry by raising cattle and philanthropic uh, support of high school FFA programs and serves as the president of the Young Farmers of America for A&M Consolidated High School. Uh, and he's married to Monty, who you might have heard of her before. <laughs> uh, for 23 years, and they have three children, reside in College Station, Texas. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Howdy, everybody. Well, that's how we say hello in, in at least Texas A&M. Uh, that is one thing that uh, we do is, is we indoctrinate. Some people say that we brainwash. So maybe by the end of the day, I might have you all standing up, whooping, and, and uh, and being a little indoctrinated. Let me go ahead and make sure that I've got the presentation right here. It should be pretty easy to, to log in. And yes, we have it right there. Okay, as um, I will be a little bit different than most of your speakers and presenters here today, I am, I'm a, what, well, growing up, I was my father's mechanic. Um, and, and literally, it, going back to when I was a little kid, I remember my dad telling me, your responsibility is to take care of our well and that make sure that my mom and all my brothers and sisters would have hot showers in, in every day. And so I was always constantly maintaining that water pump, that water well, the pressure tank, uh, draining it out, repressurizing it. And so that's where, my, where, where I really started. And a lot of the influence that I had as a child as we all know, it influences as, a, as adults. And so it has gravitated in my career that um, that, that influence uh, has continued to be successful for me. And so at, at my presentation today is how to keep your pump alive or how not to really kill your pump. Uh, in, order, in order to understand it, First off, and it's like many things, you know, when you, when you, have, a, when you have an animal that you're, that you're working with uh, and you know the b different breed types, you know their, their, their different palates, you know how they, they digest and if they will work on your range or forage that you're providing, which is no different with, with uh, a, a, a mechanical system that is going to convert mechanical energy into fluid energy. And then we're going to use that fluid energy to do something with, right? We're going to work with it like say hydraulics on uh, say tractor system or you know a squeeze chute if you'd have a hydraulic squeeze chute to move animals through or if we're moving lots of quantities of liquid as we would do for say irrigation or if we're doing flood control and so what we have is we have two families of pumps one of them is called a positive displacement pump family the other ones are non-positive displacement pump and they're real simple to actually understand it's kind of like an apple and an orange uh, the apple will start with the positive displacement pumps. They use force to actually move fluid through them, okay? And it's pretty simple to understand because they are a flow-creating device. If you actually plug up the discharge, you better have them pressure relieved because something's going to blow, okay? And they're going, the other, the other side, the, the orange, is a kinetic dynamic or what we know as centrifugal pumps, okay? And we use velocity in these models to actually accelerate the liquid in order to get it to move. And these can be what we call deadheaded, block the, the discharge, and they'll continue to run. Now, it's not good for them, but they will continue to run. And so common, common designs, uh, I'll, I'll just hit the high points here, for positive displacements, piston, gears, and vein pumps. They're very, they're, and there's quite a few more. As a matter of fact, the PD pump, the best way I can explain it is if you take a cup, you dip it out, 
and you put it into another container. You go back, you dip it out, and you put it in another container. If you go back to the old Gilligan's Island, uh, if you remember that old show from the 60s and 70s, where uh, Gilligan's sitting on a bicycle, and the professor has created those bamboo cups, and he's sitting there creating the shower for, I think, Marianne or, I don't know, Mr. or Mrs. Howell, whatever. That's like a PD pump. You grab a little bit of liquid, and then you drop it. You a little bit more, and then you drop it. On the other side, we use high velocity to move things, like a fan. If you've ever been around a fan, you know a fan, the way it actually moves air, and you can feel that, we do the same thing in these designs. Now, th these gear pumps, vein pumps, piston pumps, they come in many different forms and fashions. Uh, a lot of manufacturers will have even intellectual property on, uh, you know, associated with them to do various specialized fluid transfer. Okay, so uh, the, the basics behind these is I said PD pumps, fluid power applications. This is in your hydraulics, all right? Uh, fuel, oil fuel or oil transfer. So when you're uh, filling up your vehicle at the gas station, you're using a vein pump. Uh, if you're in using hydraulics, you could be using any one of these three, depending upon the manufacturer and what the OEM is. Okay, and then there are other specialized fluid transfer. When we get into, when we get into really specialized canning situations in the food production area, we could see some really, really unique, what we call just single use, uh, single, single pumps, uh, single piston pumps. I've seen uh, with Hormel, uh, they use uh, a, a particular plunger pump to move hams through their process. And once the hams get in the vat, they're in a very, very large vat, and as they come out, they don't come out until they get to the very pa end packaging line. They don't ever see the air after that. Very, very unique way. Um, aquaculture, another, another one that we use to, to move fish uh, around, to not damage the, the actual carcass as we go through. Many, many different uses. Now, for those people who have large, large irrigation needs, or if they have sumps, or if we have levee systems, uh, even transfer deep water wells, um, you're going to see these are going to be centrifugal pumps. These are going to be ones that we're going to use high velocity. There's three main, there's three main um, uh, uh, designs. They're radial flow design, mixed flow design, and axial flow design. Now, this one right here on the, on the left is known as a radial flow design. By far, that is the most popular pump on the planet today. Uh, more than likely, if you have a transfer pump, if you have some form of water well pump uh, or <clears throat> any industrial side pump, you'll see that it's, it's from this design where here's the suction, here's the impeller inside. The impeller is, as, as we use the word impel, to impel something, we're impelling energy from the mechanical side into the liquid to get flow. And flow comes out radially or perpendicular to the actual shaft. That's why they're called radial flow pumps. On a mixed flow pump, these would have a liquid that would come out ra not radially to the impeller, but a little bit off to the side, typically at an angle, 30 to about 40 degrees. Uh, I can get real specific into the name. A more popular name for that impeller is called the Francis Vane design. That's one of the most efficient uh, centrifugal pumps that is on the marketplace. And then the last one, if anybody's ever rid, uh, ridden on a boat before, uh, looked at the back end of seeing the prop propelling the actual the, the, the boat, very similar to this design that the liquid is going to flow down the shaft. And these are for very, very high flow rates. Um, if you wanna look at physical size, your radial pumps are gonna be really sm small in comparison to these others. Uh, the the uh, uh, largest axial flow pumps that I know that are in engineering existence in this country out of Salt Lake City, Utah, and there are three of them there. They were used to lower the lake back in the 70s, and they were a little over two, uh, almost uh, 250,000 gallons a minute is what we're seeing. Uh, and so it's not unusual to see these very, but they're not moving, moving the liquid very high. It's just a very large uh, volume to get the, get the liquid out. And so these have different performing characteristics. Um, what we find is that uh, most people don't understand the basic fundamentals just of the designs to help them understand what the, the uh, liquids that they would, they would use. 
Now, you might see, I threw some in here that you might see commonly around, around the ranch or around, uh, you know, municipalities or your home. One, common sewage pump where you would have a liquid come up from the bottom. Now, this could sit down into a sump, right? If we're going to take a, um, maybe a cesspool or we're going to have a low spot where everything drains and then we're going to pick that out and we're going to lift it out of that area. There may be a grinder plate on the bottom to grind up any leaves, could be any sort of garbage that could come in with, the, with that liquid, and then we, then we push, we push that, that liquid out. Uh, now that liquid could go a certain height, and it's based upon what we call the lifting head of the actual pump. How much head can we produce, how high we can actually move that liquid, and that translates to distance as well, not just, not just height, but how far we can go. Now, higher volume pumps, when we get into irrigation or booster line pumps, you may see these very common, where you, that, that they are radial flow. Uh, and in a case where you have a pump, a motor, and a base plate, they may be on a skid, or they may be individually set, as you can see here, that the motor is positioned uh, vertically, but the pump sees a linear flow. The linear flow, though, still acts radially, it's coming out radially. Um, traditionally, very high flow transfer, but then also a booster pump to boost once you have the limitation of that other pump. These typically are pumping in series, uh, very common to see in these transfer lines, or what we call those ones on the left, a booster pump is a very common, common uh, term. Now, other common, uh, common pumps, what we would call a canned pump or a line shaft pump, some people call these deep water well pumps as well. Some of you may have some of these that are submerged with the motor that is attached on the bottom of the actual pump, submerged down inside a well casing where you will have a, a, a line coming back up and then the electrical feed to go back down. When we get into some of our other uh, irrigation pumps, again, the, what you would see up above the ground is the motor. You'd have a coupling that connects to a shaft You'll have a series of discharges. You could be hooking these up into different, different lines where valves would be on either side, and we'd have different um, links, and these are actually expandable. You can uh, add shafts to the links of your pump, and then the uniqueness of these here, because they can actually be built custom to a well, each one of these bowls that you see here indicate the amount of lift. So, a way visually that if I would look at this, I'd say if that bowl, if I knew the model, I could say, all right, that one bowl will give me 50 feet of lift. So if I have a 200 foot well, then I know I take 200 and divide it by 50 and how many bowl stages am I going to have? Four, right, I'm gonna have four stages. And if you're going to come in and say, okay, well, we wanna drop that, that pump down, we're gonna go back in, maybe we're gonna reline it, maybe we're gonna redig it, uh, and we're going to put in a deeper casing, and I want to put that well, uh, that pump further down, I can't reuse that pump the way it is. And that's some of the mistakes that I've seen. A lot of people go back and rework something, and they don't, they, they kind of do it on their own because they're trying to save money, uh, or they don't understand the limitations of that pump. Uh, they want to, they want to push the pump faster. They want to run it faster. And what they find is that they they hit the peak limitations, they start doing damage, and I'll, I'll talk about that too here as well. Okay, and then very, very high uh, fluid transfer. Um, if, especially if you get in around the southeastern portion of the United States, if you, go to, if you go to Louisiana, that's probably the best pumping environment in the world there because they're constantly dealing with the Mississippi. Uh, and they're constantly dealing with tidal flows and it, from both, right? And uh, where we see lots of levees, lots of, of uh, channels that they'll flood different fields. So if you have any rice production in the area or if you're trying to uh, dewater an area, these are the pumps that are gonna do it. Um, you get into municipal sewer and water, very, very large uh, demand. Uh, we're talking 20 to 100,000 gallons a minute. These are the pumps for you. This is where you're gonna see these large, and they are massive. And some of the largest ones that I've seen uh, in New Orleans, at least, uh, there in the Algiers and Harvey Canal, right there outside of New Orleans, there's a new pump station there. And 
it is that each pump in that station is at 800,000 gallons a minute, and they've got 12 of them in there to help to, to alleviate some of the flooding. They, they learned um, a little valuable lesson in Katrina is what they did, and they redid, they redid that pump, this pump station there. Now, the other one is know your fluid's properties. Okay, first off, specific gravity. Uh, specific gravity is basically the relationship of the densities compared to water. Water's our universal fluid across the planet. It doesn't change uh, physically. Uh, you know, if we're here in uh, South Carolina or if we're in Australia or, or if we're in, in, in Guyana, uh, it, it's, it's our universal fluid we compare everything to. If you have uh, a specific gravity of one, your liquid has the fluid properties from a density perspective, weight per unit volume of water. If you go above one, you're heavier. If you go below one, you're lighter. Now, why would that matter? Because it's about horsepower. And think of lifting weights. If you know what you're, you, you start out lifting weights at, say, 10 pounds, and you go up to 12 or 15 pounds, you know you need more strength. Same thing if you go below. So that's what we look at. Density, and the density of water, and here we heard earlier, what was one acre, what, what was one inch of rain? 27,000 gallons? Multiply that by 8.34, 8 and that's the weight of the water that is on that acre or on that, from that inch. That's why water is so very destructive, if you really think. Uh, when we had the hurricane in Houston here a few years ago, there was so much water in that southeastern Texas area, the U.S. Geological Survey came in and said the water actually moved the land around Harris County. It, it was so much water in that, in that and, and the surrounding counties as well. It wasn't just Harris County. Uh, viscosity. Um, I like to, the way I like to think of it was what my grandfather used to say when I was a kid. Boy, you as slow as molasses in January. January is the right word, but January is the way he said it, which means that I was slow and you need to hurry up. And that's how we think of viscosity. The more resistance to flow, the thicker it is. And that also has a lot to do with the type of pump you're going to pick. So you're not going, if you're going to have a pump that's designed for gasoline and transferring gasoline, and then you're going to say a fuel oil, you may have a problem with that because gasoline is much thinner and lighter than your fuel oil. So it's getting hit both, both in viscosity and density. So it could cause problems. And then chemistry and the type of abrasives or particulates that you have in there. Chemistry, if, you know, if you're pumping fertilizer and then you're gonna say, well, I'm gonna go, then I'm gonna go pump, I'm gonna, pu I'm gonna go pump water, okay? Uh, the, or I'm going to take my water pump to go pump fertilizer. That's typically what I see. And it's like, well, but then my pump, after I cleaned it out, started making some really funky scale uh, on inside. I said, yeah, because that fertilizer was not chemically compatible to the materials. So we have to look at, we have to look at that. And then abrasives, if you think of abrasives in particulate matter, not only abrasives, the obvious one is it wears things out like sandpaper on wood. Uh, but the particulates change the density of the actual liquid. So using a water pump to pump, say, affluent out of a holding tank from a, say, stock, a stocker operation uh, or a washdown pit or something like that is going to be, need to be taken into consideration when you, when you, when you look at, at keeping those pumps alive. Now, what are 10 ways to destroy your pump? Real simple. First off, you overwork it, all right? I mean, you think about it, pumps are designed specifically for a certain amount of performance. If you go over that, you can damage it very easily. Placing these pump components under stress uh, or putting it into an operating point where it's not designed to be. So if you operate with what we call shutoff, I just mentioned it earlier, or deadhead, we close the valve on the discharge and you're not doing something to, to um, uh, minimize the amount of horsepower that's going into that pump, you're creating a lot of internal stresses. It may not just be the pump, it may be the bearings, it may be a coupling, it may be the foundation that it's, that it's on. And so if you have too much horsepower, you can actually damage, damage shafts. And, and some people may recognize that. Yeah, you know, I, I ran, overran my piece of equipment and I've cracked shafts before, broke shafts off. Um, Abrasive wear inside of that too. What we see, even though, if you might think that water is uh, what we would consider very gentle 
caustically or acidically, right, uh, it's still very abrasive. Just think of all the soil erosion that we have. We'll put that inside of a pump with materials that aren't designed to sit there and recirculate for long periods of time and not let that liquid get out. And you will wear down a pump pretty quick, if, if you're, especially if you even have extra you know, abrasive stuff. Uh, cavitation damage. How many people have heard of the term cavitation? Okay, yeah, cavitation is one, uh, is a, depending upon the design, I like to say a heart attack of the pump because you can cavitate a pump and it can keep working, but it's not gonna work as well. Your flow and your pressure or the head is going to be reduced. And you sit back and go, wow, we, we worked the heck out of this thing and we, 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 over, you know, we oversped it. You know, we had, we had the, the, the PTO set at 1,000 RPM, but you know, we kicked it up to 1,200 RPM and man, we got a lot more things transferred. The pump made a weird noise but then it stopped and then I've never seen it again. But now, now if we go back up to 1200 RPM, we're not getting the flow rate in the head that we had once before. And I'm like, mm, yeah, you probably cavitated. You did done some damage to the interior dimensions of the pump that prevented now for it to actually perform the way, the way it was designed. And cavitation damage can happen to any pump. It doesn't matter if it's a PD pump or a centrifugal pump. That's why it's very important to understand what the OEM says. Here's your operating range and don't go outside of that operating range because uh, you can really do some severe, severe damage. The higher the energy the pump is, the higher the horsepower you're pushing through, the more damaging. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, some of the other cavitation damage that happens, it happens on the outside and inside. Uh, this is an external damage on the outside of the actual impeller. This impeller, um, this is what we call a discharge cavitation. We also have suction cavitation uh, as well. And I'll, I'll show a few more pictures of some suction cavitation as, uh, uh, or later on in the presentation. Second thing, poison it. What does that mean? Pumps are designed for a specific type of uh, fluid. Uh, know that fluid. Don't go outside of that. If you change density, viscosity, particulate matters, if it's acidic to caustic, you can cause lots of damage uh, to your pump's performance. Uh, some of it might run just fine the first time and you come back and what you may have, not that you would have a drop in performance, but now you might have a leak and you're sitting there, oh boy, that my expensive fluid sometimes if you think about a fluid transfer situation, if you've got a final product that you're bottling or you're, you're moving, and now that final product is on the, on the ground, okay, or going down a drain. Uh, God forbid you're in a very highly regulatory environment and the EPA or TCQ or somebody like that shows up. And they're like, okay, now you have catch pan issues, now you got exposure issues. But after you have been using this for a while, what you see is a metallurgical damage due to corrosion uh, that corrosion also will actually erode away. So you have a combination of both uh, a galvanic corrosion, but also mechanical erosion, and it happens even faster. It'll erode those, those components. These here, what these are, these are wear rings. They're designed to wear down. They're designed so that you can bring your pump back into performance, uh, and these wear rings have been corroded all the way, or and eroded all the way through, and they've actually pushed uh, that liquid all the way inside to where it's eroded it away. And uh, once those wear rings break through, you can't get prime, you can't get the performance of the pump that you need. Uh, other areas, it's like the whole entire, the whole entire um, uh, component is covered in a foreign material. Really important here. You know, like oh well, it just it'll fluff off. No, it won't. And as a matter of fact. These, this is extra weight on the actual impeller. And so if you think about this impeller spinning, now you're requiring more horsepower. And it's not even, as you can see, you have certain high pockets of concentration of corrosion. Now it's like having an unbalanced tire. And if you've ever had that before, you know that there's severe vibration. So this then starts that, that aggressive cycle of degradation. And you see this vibration turning into bent shafts damaged bearings, and we'll see some more components later on about some of that neglect as I talk about. Uh, this one's one of my favorites. This one comes out of the Dallas Zoo is where this comes from. This was the moat pump that ran the moat around all the catch pins. And the Dallas Zoo decided to buy this particular pump, which was many people probably recognize that material as bronze. And 
the affluent from the animals actually raised the pH because of the because of the um, uh, because of the urea, and it it actually wore down the pump. So you have both you have the galvanic corrosion, and you also have the erosion from the liquid rotating through through the pump as well. So it's a one of, and you can see it's 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 chemical because it's all over the entire the entire pump impeller. Next one is to starve it. The hard part with a lot of people uh, is they say, well, my pump will suck that liquid in, right? Not all pumps suck, okay? Some of them do. PD pumps will, okay? If Sometimes, if they're designed for. A PD pump, a positive displacement, that gear, vane, and piston will create vacuum, okay? A lot of times we'll use those pumps also for vacuum style applications. Centrifugal pumps will not create vacuum. They create low pressure, meaning that they will not lift the liquid out of a sump. That's why you find a lot of, lot of centrifugal pumps down in submerged. We need that liquid above it to actually help that liquid get into the pump. And so if we starve it, then we have problems also internally with lubrication because our, typically our liquid is also our lubricant. Now there can be some part of the power frame, which is the mechanical side, the bearings, that would be starved as well because some of that liquid is used to build pressure inside the lubrication systems as well. And if we don't get the lubricants to the bearings, well then the bearings start going bad. Uh, same thing, corrosion is, is a big one. Uh, high, high temperatures, uh, and I even say friction weld themselves to the point where they're going to shear off or break components like the cages, and I've got a really good uh, one with uh, a friction welded part here in just a second. Uh, but even the right lubrication is important to understand. So if you have a liquid level lubrication, which is going to be indicated on the embossed uh, markings on the, on the uh, pump, or if you have a sight window, a sight gauge, it's important to keep that in, and in, in mind in the right level, but if there is a grease application, or some people say, well, I'll use grease on my bearings because I got this wheel bearing grease I'm using for my disc hair over here. I'm gonna use that in my pump. Well, that's a different application in lubrication, and you may need some very different type and forms of grease that goes into your pump that you can't use or you won't be using out in the field. Um, stab it, meaning small or heavy amounts of grit, sand, uh, those particulates I talked about will cause premature wear. Uh, a lot of the surface areas that we see that these go, th go through, uh, and if they are not allowed to get out of the pump fast, uh, they'll sit there and wear surfaces down. This is, an, again, another wear ring. That, that uh, The wear ring, as you can see, the galling effect. It's supposed to look like this nice, smooth surface. Uh, but because of the sand, the grit, and grime, uh, grime that's in there, and, and water well pumps uh, are very common to see this happen. I've seen some pumps being pulled out of the ground. You take them apart, and they're highly polished, and they're really pretty. And you sit back and you go, well, what type of geological strata do we have? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a water-bearing sand. Okay, did the well collapse and get a lot of sand in it, and now we're picking up a lot of sand with that water. Uh, or some people will say, well, yeah, it, it runs real sandy, milky colored, and then eventually it'll clear itself up. True, sometimes, that just depends upon your geological strata. We had a well that was like that too, and uh, the pump didn't last very long. And we had to go back in and re-sleeve the well, put, the, put a, 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 the pump further down so that we had a lot more water. And the sand, we, we dropped the well base all the way down and lifted the, the, the pump off of the well casing. You have to work with your geologists and your well, and your well experts in that area to see, okay, what type of, what type of uh, water bearing strata you have in order to create that right design to keep that from happening. The other one is choking it. Um, remember I said pumps typically don't suck, all right, unless it's a PD pump. Uh, and this means that when you create an environment that a pump has to lift or pull the liquid in, you're more likely to cavitate it than not. Now this is a term that we call engineeringly, uh, what we call, it's an acronym called NPSH, Net Positive Suction Head. Uh, there's two forms of it. There's one that is what we calculate from the source, 
which is what is available, and then what the pump requires. The way I like to look at it as a transaction. If you have enough money with the person that you're doing business with, uh, that person's requiring a certain amount. And if you have the available funds, then everything transactions very nicely, right? Everybody's happy. When that relationship gets the other way around where you don't have enough available to what is required for the payment, then things get upset, right? It doesn't happen. And that's kind of the relationship here is that we wanna make sure that we have enough available supply that, that will always be higher than what is required by that pump design. Okay, and that's something, again, like I said, getting to know what your, what your pump is. And this is a, a very, very good picture of what we call suction-related cavitation. We saw discharge earlier, and you can see the cavitation was so bad that it actually blew holes all the way through the impellers. Extremely common. We see this a lot in lots of industries. This isn't just oil and gas. We see it in municipal water. Um, and it, it, you could even have a milk production facility. And if you have a high transfer pump and you run out of that and you're not slowing your pump down, uh, you can cause. And what happens is, is that we create such a negative pressure here that we get to the liquid's vaporization point. And we have the liquid form a bubble and then the bubble implodes is what happens. And it happens millions and millions of times in milliseconds. And it is so damaging that it erodes some of the hardest material. I, ha I have one, in, I didn't put it in this presentation, but I have one impeller in my lab that is 316 stainless steel, which is pretty hard stainless steel. And uh, their holes are blown all the way through this, this uh, impeller. And it was in a liquefied natural gas transfer station. And they were trying to push the transfer uh, pump to unload tanks a little bit faster. And it took 36 minutes to blow through uh, a stainless steel impeller, which was about a half inch thick. And it, 36 minutes. And they, they said it made a really weird noise and they kept running it. And then all of a sudden it quit pumping. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it made a really weird noise. They pulled it out and I've got it in the lab. It just, it, it blew right through. It's really funny. Uh, break its limbs. What does that mean? If you load the pump frame, uh, above and what it's designed for. If you are connecting pipes, and we could call something called pipe strain, with a come along, a pry bar, or even a backhoe, which I have seen people do, where they grab a pipe and they pull it back because it's not aligned correctly, uh, you are taking all that strain, once you put the bolts in it, and once you, once you put it in and couple it together, you're putting all that strain into the frame. And that frame can crack, uh, I've seen, I've seen pipe flanges where we would remove a final bolt and, and then we're tapping it out with a punch and that bolt, the, 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 the flanges would, would jerk off and that bolt would shoot across the room. And because and, we're trying to do a final inspection and the, the, the pipes are already connected. Uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the checkpoints, if you're ever purchasing and having somebody install a pump for you, is to see where those, flat, those pipes are lined. And I said, I want to be on site to see how you do that because we don't need those. Because a, a lot of people who, uh, and I'm not picking on, on, on a welders and fitters because I was a welder. Um, well, we'll do the best we can. Um, but if the pump is not there, we'll pull, pull, pull the pipes to that point and then we'll have the pump installer come in. And the pump installer will say, oh, well, the, the, it's off. So I'll get a cheater bar, pry bar, come along, backhoe, whatever, and let's get that connected. And then the next thing you know, You'll be running for a little while and you'll have cracked flanges, cracked cases, things like that. Fry it. Run it outside its operating temperature. Uh, if you run it outside its operating temperature, remember pumps are going to have seals. Seals are typically elastomers. Elastomers don't get very, very, they don't, they don't last long in high temperatures. And if you run it above its own temperature, you might say, well, how do I do that? Well, if you run the pump dry, you will increase the temperature drastically inside the case. And so if you see the tank level go down and you're on a far end of the property or whatever, how are you gonna shut that pump off? I, I, even during the, the, the primary startup of the pump, there are some manufacturers that say, oh yeah, you can run it dry. My next question to that pump, that pump expert is, okay, how long? Oh yeah, well, you can't run that long. Well, how long is long? Me, I say, never run your pumps dry. 
always flood them, always get them filled, always prime them because you don't know what you're going to damage. Uh, and it's difficult, especially it's a very large pump when you're trying to fill it up. Uh, here are some actual parts that actually friction welded themselves together. These are pretty high energy pumps, but uh, it can happen on a small pump as well. Uh, as you can see, the, the material melting, and that's the, actual, that's the actual cast iron of the actual pump inside of the, uh, inside of the mechanical side. There's a, there's a nice one, friction weld itself, that when it friction welded, it just spalled that right off the shaft. Uh, and, and that's, uh, believe it or not, it's very common to see that uh, in, in operation. Uh, heat damage also thermally hardens certain parts and then they become very, very brittle. And that's, that's actually a sacrificial sleeve that goes onto one of the input shafts and that sleeve broke. And you can see it also spun. You can, you can actually see how it was spinning inside of the actual frame of the actual pump too, not just cracking as well. Uh, shake it to pieces. Uh, like I'd mentioned before, if you have excessive vibration, if you have excessive uh, uh, low, um, uh, imbalancing, you'll create enough vibrational translatory, what we call translatory uh, uh, dimensional shift that you can actually damage seals, bearings. Bearings don't last very long in this scenario as well. Impellers, pistons, they don't like it. Uh, and depending upon your foundation and how you, how, how you have your, and how big the pump is, uh, most centrifugal pumps need three to five times the amount of, of weight. So say like your skid is a thousand pounds, pump motor base plate. You need five to 8,000 pounds of, of foundation that it should be mounting on. And a lot of, a lot of people don't do that um, at, at all. And that's to dampen the vibration and to secure it correctly. Uh, drown it, okay? Now that's part of more on the mechanical side. And if you get liquid inside of your bearing housing, or what we call the power frame, and that liquid, especially over a period of time, if it's not running, of course, will cause rust. That rust is going to actually then get picked up, and as you start rolling, that bearing again will break off, and what you basically have is a contaminant inside of that bearing that's gonna wear it down, or it could actually uh, lock the bearing in place as well. Um, that water causes some pretty nasty effects to your lubrication as well, uh, breaking it down and causing uh, the, the actual lubricant to be destroyed as well. And then overall, neglect. Part of this, it's been sitting out in the field for a very long time. We don't turn it over, but maybe once every nine months or something like that. Uh, these cause a lot of premature wear. It's like anything that you store equipment-wise and don't use for a long period of time. Then you go through a storing process, okay? Same thing with your pumps that are out there. Some of this neglect, um, part of it is, is, is a lot of it's corrosion-based, uh, where you see the, the, the shafts and, and shaft seals are going to be damaged because when you start this, when you start it up after it's been sitting for a very long time, if you had any corrosion in there, that's if it's iron oxide, uh, it's going to wear it like some of the best, some of the best um, um, material to grind down particles are, are, are oxides, and iron oxide is no different from that. Uh, mechanical seals, they will adhere to themselves. A lot of mechanical seals have, as you can see, this one here has a has a spring that adjusts for the different pressures inside the pump to keep the pump sealed. And as you can see, as the, as the corrosion happened, because it's been sitting for a very long time, it locked the seal up to the point where the ceramic, the ceramic uh, seal itself shattered upon startup and cracked in multiple places because of that, that, high, that, that uh, high resistance to movement. And uh, a lot of, even if it's not a mechanical seal, Packing will have a very similar effect because the packing inside of it is not lubricated anymore because the, the, the liquid is gone. That's one of the challenges with packing is that, again, remember I said, the liquid is there to be our lubricant. And packing, even they may be graphite packing or silicon packing, still requires a certain amount of liquid to be in there to reduce the amount of friction that we're going to see. And we see this over, over amping a motor or causing damage on the actual shaft. So these are just some, some other damaged uh, components uh, that we see from neglect. Um, freezing is an effect. This is one of, the, uh, one of the, this last seal that I have here. This is a mechanical seal that pulled out and was sent to me by FlowServe and said, hey, take a look at what their last big, huge, um, we heard Texas had a pretty nice winter this last winter for about, what, six days? <laughs> Something like that, six, seven days? And it was a real, it was a real winter for us. Uh, 
this is what happened. Uh, the liquid gets inside, it expands, it cracks, so we didn't have the proper winterized type seal pack in this pump to keep the pump from freezing up. And we, we learned our lesson. We're seeing a lot of municipalities, a lot of people going back in and saying, hey, caused a tr tremendous amount of damage. Now, the, 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 the worst thing about this is the pump will not pump without a leak. It'll still work, it's just gonna leak everywhere. And then the, the challenge comes in is that you're, of course, putting everything on the ground. So a special thanks to everybody that, that is here, uh, FlowServe, Pump Works, Viking Pump, John Crane, uh, and then Matthew Balban, he's a professional engineer from Advanced Pump Repair Service and the DXP Pump Lab, who, and what I built there at Texas A&M. And I'm opening up the floor for anybody who has a question for me. Hope I, hope I learned you something, as my grandfather would say. I hope, I hope I learned you something. Um, and anybody who would like to talk to me about anything afterwards, if you've got troubleshooting or pump size or something like that, I'd be glad to go ahead and talk to you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it very much.